Last week, we saw the ill-fated invasion of North Africa by the forces of Italy in 1939, the coming of Rommel and the Afrika Corps, the gallant Commonwealth stand at Tobruk, and the eventual rout of the enemy by General Montgomery and the Eighth Army at El Alamein in October 1942. Today, we continue our story. It begins with a conference in Washington where secret plans are made for a large-scale invasion of North Africa and continues to the ultimate outcome of the bitter four-year struggle for control of the Middle East. presents The Big Picture, an official report produced for the armed forces and the American people. The Washington Conference was top level. Prime Minister Churchill arrived from London. High-ranking members of the military staffs were present. The results of that conference were kept top secret. Few knew of the tremendous plan formulated there, which would call for preparations on a scale never before equaled in military history, the Allied invasion of North Africa. There were 123 days in which to get ready. Hundreds of ships to be prepared. Ships armed and loaded with some 700,000 items of equipment. of supplies, stockpiled for what was to come. Vast numbers of troops suddenly found themselves engaged in intensive training. days passed, it was evident that something big was at hand, big enough to involve a maximum effort from two continents, from both Britain and America. But what? October 24, 1942. While the British Eighth Army was smashing Rommel and the Germans at El Alamein, a vast troop convoy set sail from American ports. The next day, two convoys left Britain. In all, three convoys, 700 ships, traveling 5,000 miles. the men aboard the convoys had no inkling of the scope of their undertaking. Nothing to do but relax and wonder. Destination unknown. Speculations plentiful. Rumors 
even more so. As the days crawled by, tension mounted. What lay ahead for them and where? Finally, the secret was out. North Africa. The men were fully aware of the bitter fighting waged there for three years, of the Africa Corps, Rommel, and Tobruk. And as the convoy steamed onward, a bulletin was received of the retreat of the German army, resulting from the shattering El Alamein battle. The plan, invasion. The objective, rout the Axis powers from North Africa. The invasion was to be made hundreds of miles west of El Alamein at three points. Casablanca, Oran, Algiers. General Mark Clark had previously landed in Algeria to confer with French officers. General Henri Giraud would lead the Free French forces. The entire operation was under the command of General Dwight D. Eisenhower, appointed by the Joint Chiefs of Staff. At 3 a.m. on November 8th, the convoys converged west of Gibraltar. The events planned four months ago were about to become history. Now, everything depended upon taking the enemy by surprise. Lieutenant General George S. Patton, Jr. speaks. Soldiers and sailors. It is not known whether the French African army will contest our landing. But all resistance, by whomever offered, must be destroyed. However, when any of the French soldiers seek to surrender, you will accept it and treat them with the respect due a brave opponent and future ally. This was Casablanca, the northwest corner of Africa. H hour. The invasion began. The ensuing events, now in the hands of fate. also H hour at Algiers. Planes based at Gibraltar flew over to give extra insurance for the success of the operation. And it was a success. Opposition in Algiers was slight. In a short time, it was in Allied hands. Oran, H hour. Here the paratroops went into action. Fighting was bitter. But after two hard days, troops of the enemy Vichy French capitulated. Oran was taken, two down, one to go. But at the Atlantic port of Casablanca, there was trouble. The Vichy French Navy still fought for the Axis. Fighting on the water was heavy. 
Allied guns pounded the port and the Vichy fleet. The battle lasted for five grueling days. But on November 12, Vichy Deputy Chief of State Admiral Darlan reached an agreement with General Eisenhower and ordered all French in Africa to cooperate with the Allies. Resistance ceased at Casablanca. The troops rolled in. Of the prisoners taken, none seemed to be very popular with the civilians. The greatest invasion in military history was a success. The enemy had been taken by surprise. The first phase in the Allied invasion of North Africa was over. In addition to General Eisenhower, the British First Army was commanded by General Anderson. The French troops were under General Giraud. The next step, move east swiftly. Time was precious. The Allies moved toward the Tunisian border, hoping to reach Bizerti and Tunis before the Germans could rush in reinforcements. We pushed on despite all but impossible roads and shoddy railroad facilities. But still we moved on by land and in the air, which was our best means of transportation. by air that the German forces struck back. they did, German reinforcements poured in from Sicily. November 18, the Allied advance guards entered Tunisia. Our line of supply was now 500 miles long. By November 22, the town of Beja was reached. Majors al -Bab. the terrain became more and more precarious. November 25, at Majors al -Bab, the first tank battle occurred. The Germans lost 15 tanks and withdrew. They moved back to the mountain approaches in the northern tip of Tunisia. At Matur, they waited. We attempted a thrust. It was all important. Time was running out. Winter was coming. This time, we failed. The Germans were too strongly emplaced. We fell back. 
the Tunisian front was now stabilized on a line running north and south from Majors El Bab. For the North African winter had come. The war bogged down in a morass of mud. Hopes for a lightning victory in North Africa were forgotten. Airfields were flooded. Bad roads became worse. With the line stabilized, the war became a waiting game. Daily reports at the time would say action was light on the Tunisian front. Actually, this light action accounted for half our casualties in the campaign. During this time, patrols were sent out continuously. a few of the captive enemy would be returned. Sometimes they weren't so lucky. In the clouds, there was more activity. In a single week, Allied planes destroyed 241 enemy aircraft. We lost 89. Bases, it was possible to make devastating attacks on Italy, Sardinia, and Sicily. But the main activity during this lull was the Battle of Supply. Both sides girded themselves. The British 8th Army was racing west from Libya to meet us. In Tunisia, the winter would soon be over. The crucial struggle loomed ahead. the struggle was momentarily forgotten. A day dedicated to peace on Earth. Christmas in Tunisia, 1942. January 14, 1943. American troops in Casablanca were startled to see a familiar face from home. The president arrived. And Prime Minister Churchill came. General Charles de Gaulle and General Giraud were brought together to unite the fighting men of France. The Casablanca conference was underway. It was held to set the requirements for victory, not only in North Africa, but all over the world. The ultimate object, no appeasement, no negotiation, nothing short of complete victory over the enemy. In the Civil War, General Grant had first used the term, now President Roosevelt used it, unconditional surrender. The stage was set. After the conference, Mr. Churchill flew to Tripoli and greeted General Montgomery. The climax in North Africa was approaching. But there was still fight in the enemy. The veteran 21st Panzer Division attacked, and German armor overran the Kasserine Pass. 
However, infantry and artillery support from the 9th and 34th Divisions, plus British units and bombers, stopped the Germans and drove them back through the pass. Though a setback to the Allies, there was something gained. The troops became, in General Eisenhower's words, battle-wise and tactically efficient. It was the last Nazi offensive in Africa. By this time, the British 8th Army had caught up with Rommel's forces at the Merritt Line. On March 15, 1943, Rommel was recalled to Germany. He never returned. His army had retired to the Merritt Line's fortified hills. With the Americans at Magnassi and the French to the south, Montgomery kept up a pounding assault on the line to divide Axis reserves. Pinning the enemy in front, he flanked to the left and delivered a telling blow. The New Zealanders moved on this flank. The 4th Indian Division circled the rear. closed in, supported by heavy air assault. And the Merritt line cracked. The Nazis abandoned the field with the light armor on their heels. The Battlewise 1st Armored Division pushed east to cut off the enemy retreat. Patton saw them close on the enemy flank. April 7, 1943, a big day. British patrols met advance guards of the American 2nd Corps on the Gob Road. Thus, Allied lines were linked. Now the British 8th could be supplied from North African ports and troops could be shuttled along the entire Tunisian front. The U.S. 2nd Corps, under General Bradley, moved north to the Beja Road, which ran to Bezerti. The end was in sight. the British 8th opened the final offensive. Anfidaville was taken, and the natives began to return to their homes. Relentlessly, the Allies pushed onward to Bizerti and Tunis. The going was slow, tough, and dangerous because the enemy was holed up in the surrounding hills. Key positions often changed hands several times before the German defenders were forced to fall back. Hill after hill was stormed or flanked in bitter fighting. Our big attack was at Jabal Tahent, Hill 609. It was the main enemy position. On April 28 and 29, the enemy laid down a heavy mortar fire, and we replied with artillery as we attempted to storm the heights. The going was rough. On May 1, we took Hill 609. The plan for victory in the northern tip of Tunisia had been likened to a cylinder, a machine to compress the enemy until he was destroyed. The compression was about to show results. Swiftly, one by one, the towns on the road to Tunis and Bizerti fell, Matur, Massacolt, Ferryville. There was no stopping the Allied push now. The enemy found themselves forced into a pocket from which there was no escape.
Nazis may have invented the Blitzkrieg, we were improving on it. The armor forged ahead. Tanks broke through enemy lines. On May 7, 1943, the Germans were surprised by the Allied arrival outside Tunis. There was no organized resistance. For the Germans, there was no front left. The town of Tunis was turned into a carnival. The streets were so full of crowds and celebrations, traffic could hardly move. The same day, May 7, at almost the same hour, we entered Bizerti. The reception here was not so jubilant. Hitler had ordered his troops to fight to the last cartridge. But there was no fight to the finish. Still fond of parades and brass bands, they marched in. Total wholesale surrender. Among the 267,000 prisoners taken were 14 German and four Italian generals. were relatively light. We had destroyed 250 enemy tanks and 2,330 aircraft. Now Air Marshal Tedder launched a furious assault upon Italian islands off the Tunisian coast. By June 13, the last ones were taken. The conquest of North Africa was complete. Now the Middle East was safe, Africa was liberated, and from there came re-echoing the phrase that would be fulfilled in the invasion of Italy, D-Day, V-E Day, unconditional surrender. El Alamein had been the end of the beginning. For the Axis powers, it was now the beginning of the end. The big picture is an official report for the armed forces and the American people. Produced by the Army Pictorial Center. Presented by the Department of the Army in cooperation with this station.